Are doctors perverting their Hippocratic oath because of who holds the medical purse strings? Are we losing our freedom of choice to seek medical treatment from a provider that we can trust? Are there alternative treatments for cancer and other diseases that have provided life-saving results without toxic side effects at a lower cost than traditional treatments? Is the government, through one of its institutions, disseminating false information about medical care and treatment without regard for the welfare of the people? Most doctors work essentially for the insurance company and the, and the government because it, is, because it is they who hold the purse strings. And doctors have perverted their Hippocratic Oath to function really for the employer. My name is Sergeant Rick Schiff. I'm an 11-year veteran of the San Francisco Police Department. I hold the department's highest medal of honor for bravery. That used to mean a lot more to me than it does now. What I'd like to talk to you about today is my now seven-year-old daughter. This is an identical twin. Her sister is now dead. Her sister, when she was four years old, Kristen, developed a highly malignant brain tumor that had spread throughout her spine and her brain. The doctors told us that we had really two options, take her home, let her die, or bring her in for massive dosages of chemo and radiation simultaneously. In either event, she was going to die. They were quite certain of that, and very quickly. Uh, believing her only chance to be the standard route, we gave her the chemo and radiation. It burned her skull so bad she had second degree burns and her hair never came back. To change her diapers, we had to wear rubber gloves because her urine was so toxic and it burned her. At the end of six months, miraculously, she survived the standard treatment, although there was a high expectation she wouldn't. Um, she still had cancer. We were told, sorry, we've done everything we can. Now she's going to die, probably within a couple of months. My wife and I, choosing not to accept that, started reading. The first book I picked up, the third chapter, discussed Dr. Brzezinski. Um, as you may guess, I have some expertise in fraud. In fact, I'm quite certain there are enough attorneys in the room that I could be vordeered as an expert in fraud. And I conducted my own investigation. I have no doubt the man is not a fraud. I have no doubt that he does what he does out of earnest belief that his medicine works. And now you're in a position to judge for yourselves whether it works or not. But it's well established by the FDA that it's non-toxic. Eighteen months later, we took my daughter off the antineoplastin. She had not died. She had no signs of tumor. She remained free for 18 months of cancer. Within a month, the cancer was widespread in her brain. We put her back on Brzezinski's. By the way, at the objections of our doctors, for some reason felt that it had failed her. We put her back on. Within nine weeks, the tumor was completely gone. She died last July of neurological necrosis. Her brain fell apart from the radiation. The autopsy showed that she was completely cancer-free. Out of 52 cases of that disease ever, no one died cancer-free, just Chrissy. So she didn't die of a terminal illness. She died of my inability to care for her properly, and she died from bad advice. She died because there's a government institution that disseminates false information and is not looking out for the welfare of the people. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I swore an oath 11 years ago, and I think most of us in this room swore it at one time or another to uphold the Constitution. It says life right in the beginning. While undergoing his research to acquire his Ph.D., Dr. Brzezinski made a profound discovery. He found a strain of peptides in human blood and urine that had never before been recorded in biomedical research. As his curiosity in these peptides evolved, he made another profound observation. People who were inflicted with cancer seemed to lack these newly discovered peptides in both their blood and urine, while those who were healthy and free of cancer appeared to have an abundance of these peptides. Dr. Brzezinski theorized that if he could somehow provide a way to chemically extract these peptides from the blood and urine of healthy donors and administer these peptides to those with cancer, perhaps it could be useful in treating the disease. I first heard of Dr. Brzezinski back in the late 1980s when he was in a battle with the Texas Medical Board and the FDA regarding his innovative approach to cancer. I wasn't surprised by that. Anyone who's innovative in medicine creates waves in the medical system. However, in his case, I was continually surprised that they didn't put him out of business. I kept hearing about him. So in the mid-1990s, I said, Dr. Brzezinski, 
I want to come down to visit your clinic and find out what you're doing. It's very new to me. When I arrived, he had seven charts ready for me to review that had been reviewed by the National Cancer Institute, who also made a site visit the year before. The National Cancer Institute reported that these seven patients were either in complete remission or there was substantial improvement. I was astounded. Dr. Brzezinski had MRIs of brain tumors known to be almost universally fatal that had simply disappeared. It was obvious to me that Dr. Brzezinski had made the most important discovery in cancer treatment ever. It's what we have been looking for.